Welcome to episode three of the Everyday Christian Podcast. So this past week, Jonathan and I were able to catch up with Michael Shank. That's right, Michael Shank, the author of Muscle and a Shovel. He was so gracious with his time, and we were able to do a phone interview with him for over an hour. We have divided our conversation into a two-part series. In this episode, part one, we get to know Mike. Jonathan and I asked him several questions about what made him decide to publish his conversion story. Much to his surprise, it has now sold over a million copies. He talks to us about his daily journaling habits, and he tells us about some of the great rewards and, and even some challenges he's experienced since Muscle and Shovel has been published. We talk about how effective Muscle and Shovel has been as an evangelistic tool in our local congregation. You'll learn that he's just a, just a normal guy, an everyday Christian who has done some extraordinary work with the talent the Lord has given him. This interview was conducted over the phone, so I apologize in advance that some of the audio quality is less than optimal. Mike, however, is a gifted writer and one of the most humble individuals you'll ever meet. The interview was a casual one, but by the end, Jonathan and I felt like we were talking to an old friend. So, here it is, Episode 3, Part 1 of the Interview with Michael Shank. All right, we have with us today Michael Shank. Michael is a uh, author of Muscle and Shovel and some other works, and he sold over one million copies. You may be familiar with some of his works. Got him on the phone today. We're going to ask him some questions and, and kind of pick his brain about, uh, about about the book and how it all got started. Michael, I hope everything's going good with you out your way. <laughs> John, it's great. It's great talking with you. I want to tell you how humbled I am that you asked me to – uh, do this interview with you, man. I'm, I, I hope you're not disappointed when we're done. I think there's so many people out there that would do a much better interview with you than me, and a lot man. more important than I am, for sure. You are by far our most distinguished guest in the uh, early history of the Everyday Christian Podcast. <laughs> wow, you, you've really got to pick up your, you really got to raise your standards, your bar, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, I, I, I just get right to it. I know people are just dying, and I myself too, to know what in the world might made you decide to write uh, a book of your conversion story. Man, that's a great that's a great question, John. I'll tell you this: I I kept a diary. I started writing when I was a kid. I don't ask me why. I have no clue. I've always done it. Uh, and you know, when I was when I was a oh probably in grade school. I found out that girls wrote uh, in diaries. Right. And, and you know, um, I wondered, well, wait a minute. Am I doing something that a girl does? You know, it kind of, <laughs> it kind of scared me. But I've always wrote down my daily activities and, and done that for a long time. But, you know, I did not want to write that story. It was already written, first of all, but I didn't want to put it in a book. Right. I don't know if you – I think I think I wrote it in the back of, of Muscle and Shovel, but what happened was I had written this whole story as it happened back in 87 and 88. And I on the front of the spiral notepad, I wrote my conversion story, 1988, and I threw that spiral pad along with a bunch of others in an old box. And that yeah. thing sat in our attic for over 20 years, I guess. Wow, wow. And then when we were moving, I was actually uh, hired to preach at the Church of Christ in a little town of Metropolis, Illinois. And I'll never forget, we was unloading the moving truck. You know the metal ramps that you pull yeah. out of the back of the truck? Right. Well, I'm I'm going down one of those ramps, and I got all these boxes in my hand. And I hit the bottom right there at our open garage, and I tripped. And you want to talk about God's providence. This is so weird. <laughs> right. I tripped, and those boxes I was holding shot across the floor. And in that top box, that thing popped open, and that spiral notepad shot across the concrete floor. And when I got when I when I got myself up off the floor, I start collecting all this stuff up, throw it back in these boxes, and there it was, my conversion story. Right. And I got to laugh, and I said, Johnny, you look at this. I haven't looked at this in years. Yeah. And just real casual, almost flippant, she said, you ought to turn that into a book. Hmm. And I laughed it off. I said, no way. I'm never doing that. <laughs> and that's, 
that's that's how one thing led to another. She kept on me and kept on me. I said, honey, we're members of the Church of Christ. She said, what's that have to do with anything? And I said, hey, we don't give testimonials in the Church of Christ. I said, that's just one big testimonial. And I said, besides that, nobody give hard-earned money for that. Well, we're certainly glad you uh, you went against your judgment and went with hers for sure. I got a couple, <laughs> couple of questions on that front. Um, yeah. So I thought to myself, like, it would be cool if I write down, maybe not every day, but maybe once a week, have kind of a journal entry to kind of, kind of, you know, record or, or document my week. But I, I, I can't hardly get focused enough to do it. But I love people that do, and I love going back and and seeing it on TV, you know, when somebody passes away or something, they've got almost, not memoirs, but they've got something for their family to go back and look at, you know, 1980, whatever, we built our house. And, and you know, and what if you had a, an entry on, you know, maybe the birth of your, your first child or, or I don't know. I mean, I just think it's neat when people journal to be able to, you know, it could last for years on end. And uh, your grandkids, great-grandkids kids could have some of your writing. And they never really even knew you, but they, they could get to know you. I think it's cool. I, I, you said that you were uh, fearful that it was something that girls did, but I, I think it's a very, very unique. I think it's a, it's a good thing to do, and I'm so very glad you of all people decided to do it. Yeah. You know, don't don't you find it interesting that the things we do in our life that are seemingly trivial at the time, for sure. Right. Uh, the things we do in our life that later in life God can take and, and use those things in the most interesting, strange ways. That that just blows my mind. That's true. I'll, uh, today I've had a, an interesting day. I've, I've closed on a new house today at 1 o'clock. I had a move, oh, move congratulations. Back to my, moved back to my family farm, which we're excited about. And I'm interviewing Michael Shank. That needs to be on my journal. This is right. <laughs> right. That's that. <laughs> I'm gonna start it today. And the songs you've listened to, if you've listened to any songs or if you eat anything today, you've got to write it all down. It's important. Yeah, yeah. Today's a big day. I'm gonna start today. That's, so you also, that's a red letter day for you, John. Congratulations, it's a big day. man. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So tell me, you you mentioned, and I've heard you say before, you know, members of Church of Christ, you know, we're not we're not big on testimonials, and I know exactly what you mean, but I'm not sure that I agree with the sentiment in some way. So I told me and Jonathan mm-hmm. were talking just a, a few minutes ago, you know, we don't, we may not call it that, but why in the world, well, we probably steer away from it for fear. Yeah, yeah, we shy away for fear of being like every other denomination out there that's over-utilizing mm. the term, I think. Would you yeah. agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what. Well, one of the things about me, I'm typically pretty controversial. People, at least they tell me that, and I'm probably going to say some controversial stuff today. Uh, okay. I'll bring I'll bring a point up to you right now. You know, we in the Lord's body, and I love the, the blood-bought church, man. I love the body of Jesus Christ more than anything in this world. That's why I do what I do. But I often wonder, when we read the New Testament, we see that the brethren came together, and, and, and they were more, it seemed to me, if you – the writings of the first century show that they – participated and i often wonder you know we've gotten to a place where we're more spectators today and and i'm not saying i have a solution or not everybody should just jump up and start preaching or speaking i'm not saying that at all but it does seem like got a lot of spectators i know what I, you mean i worry sometimes that makes folks apathetic and you know in the in the baptist church that i was raised in there'd be a time almost every sunday where the preacher would would tell people, "Hey, get up and give a testimonial." So, for our listeners that don't know what that is, that's just folks stand up right in the pew and and they talk about what they believe that God has done for them in their life. Right. And uh, we don't. I'm not saying we see that in the scripture. I don't. I don't think we see quite that in the scripture. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. What that would have been like, but it would be. It might might behoove us to help folks get a little more engaged in some way. I agree. And one of the best stories, I mean, uh, you know, the most powerful book is, is maybe Acts, you know, where it's simply oh, a, yeah. a book of conversion, is it not? I mean, what if we didn't That's have right. the, the conversion of, of Saul? So, 
I know what you're. I know what you're saying. I think it's probably because of the the the, the term we shy away from. But uh, a conversion story, a testimonial, if you if you will, is certainly biblical. Mm, yes. When you that's the that's the biblical part. You bet. Well, John, I got an email a few hours ago. Can I read this to you? Please, yeah. Because, you know, I haven't thought about this, but this is probably pretty pertinent to what you're talking about right now. This is from, uh, I'm sure he won't mind if I say his name, <laughs> because I'm sure he, won't. He, he runs a, a prison ministry in Florida, in Crestview, Florida. His name is Tom Dugan. And Tom okay. sent me an email. Uh, he said, I conduct a prison ministry in northwest Florida uh, from basically Tallahassee West in state prisons. We've been using muscle and shovel to baptize 12 inmates in 2019, have another seven inmates at the state facility in Panama City. Uh, your book is often passed around until uh, the covers are almost worn off. Keep up the good wow. work. So isn't that an encouragement? Very much so. That's not me bragging, man. That's not me bragging. What, what's exciting is 12 souls were, were buried with Christ. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I do see, uh, I think sometimes, the, the my experience with, you know, hearing people give testimonials in other places at school or at some functions somewhere in the community is sometimes the testimonial just goes off of, off the path, you know, and you, there's subject <laughs> to what the person believes God is or is not doing. And I think that can can sometimes, if you're not careful, I mean, it kind of goes into a direction that the, the church may not want it to go. Does that make sense? <laughs> Man, that is so wise, uh, and you are exactly right. So it may be better not to just let those folks have the floor. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know where the balance is, but I think there is certainly some benefit from us sharing our conversion. Maybe the key, maybe the key there would be the time and the place. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. you don't do it oh, yeah. there in a worship setting, I guess you'd say, but, you know, uh, at, at another yeah, no, time, no, not maybe during worship. fellowship, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, hey, thank God for uh, wise and good elders, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, it sounds like you were a, a relatively normal guy that journaled from time to time, at least. That was it. Do you still journal? I do. You journal every day or every, every day? Every day. Try to every single day. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. So you've got stacks of these yeah. books. Or oh, yeah. Notebooks. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, my handwriting's so bad, it's getting worse as I'm getting older. I don't, I don't yeah. know if anybody else notices that, but I find it bizarre that my handwriting's getting so much worse. So now I type. Uh, I'll just – I just run a, 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 a Microsoft Word journal constantly. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so you're a you're a normal lay person Christian, and that's it. You decide your wife uh, Anita has said you need to put this in a book, and after you mull it over and kind of laugh about it, and at some point you get serious and decide, hey, I'll I'll I'll, I'll look into it. If, you know, where, sometimes where, our wives are kind of like drill sergeants, and where you, uh, and where I mean that in the most affectionate way. Uh, right, <laughs> and you know she stayed on me. She wasn't going to let that go. That was two thousand. That was October thirty first, two thousand eight, that that Jeez. happened. That we were moving into the parsonage, and then in uh, in uh, let's see, it would have been late winter, early spring of two thousand eleven. After about two and a half years of her ever ever week or so saying, "Hey, Mike, you need to put that into a book. You need to put it into a book." About two and a half years of that. I finally said, look, if it'll get you to shut up, I'll do it. <laughs> I was just going to try to get her off my back. Where do you and start? Uh, and so, <laughs> well, you know, I, I told her I, I gave her all the objections, objections, and her, I'll tell you how wise my wife is. It, it truly just blows my mind that she looked at me and she said, look, if it would help one soul, would you do it and would it be worth it? And I said, oh, man. Guilt I mean, trip. She, she <laughs> All right the guilt trip. <laughs> yeah, and I said, you know, she knew how I loved lost souls, and I said, well, honey, if it helped one person, then I'll do it. And so, uh, I, it, it's funny because John, I sent the manuscript to all of our our brotherhood uh, publishers and bookstores, and and bless their hearts, it's not their fault. They just said, Mike, you know, it's two thousand. 11, 
our brother our brethren don't read novels. And they said if you'll chop it up into a a class workbook into a thirteen week workbook, we'll publish it. I don't know if you knew that part of the story, but I, I told not. them no. I said, No, I'm not gonna chop that up for anybody. I'm not gonna chop it up. So finally I found this place in Laverne, Tennessee. And um uh, really thankful I didn't chop it up. But you know our brethren didn't I mean that was the case at that time. That our our brethren just didn't read novels, novels didn't sell in our brotherhood bookstore. So who would have known, John, who in the world would have known that this would do this? Nobody could have known anything. No, there's no way. But do you think that maybe they would have, but there's just nothing out there like that? I mean, you know, know, people who – I'm sorry, go ahead. I I mean, it wasn't the norm to read a novel, but there wasn't a whole lot of choices either. You know what I mean? So maybe it was much more traditional maybe to do it in a classroom-type workbook, but really that was the only option – that I would have known of in 2011, anyway. Now, brother, I think you I think you hit it right on the mark. It's 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 true. Um, they they weren't our brethren weren't writing them, and and folks weren't buying them, and and so it was kind of a it's, as strange as it sounds. It's just a, a kind of an unknown. Uh, it was an enigma in the, in the in the body at that time, and and for publishers especially. And now, uh, what's so neat is books are coming back, man. Guys, do what? I think books have kind of made a charge uh, uh, back. I thought they would probably, you know, die out in, in an electric, or excuse me, electronic, you know, or a digital world. It seems like you know, books are, are selling as good today as they ever have, if not more. I read an article that said that this new generation, these uh, kids that are 25 and under, would much prefer to have a printed book in their hands than to buy an ebook. Something if about that, if that means anything or says anything. Coffee. The cup of coffee, holding a book uh, on the balcony in the early morning, or something about it, <laughs> or snuggling up, uh, it. you know, on the, in the recliner with your uh, your socks and uh, a blanket and reading a good book, or something about that. <laughs> there is, there is, there's no doubt about it. So you got the, hey. the, the company in Tennessee to agree to publish. Yeah, yeah, Lightning Lightning Source Press. They're a they're a self publishing company. Uh, they're they're a print on demand self publishing company. And so, how many, how many did you publish first time? I ran it. I ran it through them, and and uh, we've we've had a couple of other printers that we've worked with uh, over the years. So we've, I guess, we've had about three different printers so far. But Lightning Source does an outstanding job. They they handle all the uh, as far as putting the work out on Amazon and all the digital platforms and Barnes and Noble and all that. They take care of all that. And so Johnny and I can go ahead and, and work and live our life and not have to worry about trying to figure out how to market a book. Right. So how many copies were there the very first print? Any idea? Oh, the first – well, you know, that's a great – that's a great question. Um, man, I don't, I don't really remember because, see, Muscle, when we put it out – you know, John, for 14 months, it sold less than 10 copies a month. Really? It, it took a little while. For 14 too. months. Right. It didn't. I did nothing. I even remember telling John Edith in the uh, summer of 2012, I said, there you go. See, it didn't do a thing. I told you nobody would buy that and, and, and <laughs> give her good money for that thing. And, and she said, you just wait and see. And she just kept saying that. I don't. She's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so this thing just snowballed. Well, this this brings us to a point, I think, we as Christians need to maybe focus on and remember. And that is that, um, you know, John, if God wants something, uh, he's, his will is going to be done. Yeah. And if he doesn't, there's nothing in the world you can do to change it. And so we were going along, and it was selling, you know, 10 copies. And uh, and then in, I think, September 2012, uh, a good friend of mine, a gospel preacher, he was in McLeod, Oklahoma at that time. They bought 200 copies of it, and and his name is Bradley Cobb, and just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And he he convinced the congregation to buy uh, 200 copies, and then it went from 200 to, I think, 2,000 the next month, right. to 6,000 to 10,000. 
and just like you said, it just snowballed. And it's still going today. I, I know. It's still going, nine years. I, yeah. I have people asking me all the time, hey, uh, do you know where I could get the book Must Want a Shovel? <laughs> Isn't that great? Thank God. Yes, it is. Absolutely. So you said that you – There's some got folks it. on Amazon trying to sell it. We don't sell on Amazon anymore. We just sell it through our site because we stripped all the profit out of it. We've got it down to 10.95 now, and it's our whole, wholesale cost. But there's some folks on Amazon that are trying to sell it for forty, fifty, and sixty dollars a copy. So right, I've seen that. Trying to take advantage, so uh, it, the brethren can save money. They just can buy it direct from our site and and get it for wholesale, and it's just become a labor of love for us. I'll tell you how I first came to know it. And it was probably in uh, 2012, 2013, 2014. I'm not exactly sure, but we had a. Uh, 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 the Memphis Field of Preaching had a campaign at our local congregation here in, in Skyline, uh, just outside of Tupelo, Mississippi, and they came in, and I, one of the um, students there stayed with me in my home, uh, he and uh, uh, maybe one more, and his name was Josh Holloway. Josh preaches down in actually uh, northwest Florida right now, I believe, at a congregation down there, but he, before he left, he, he said, I've got a book that you need to read, and uh wasn't a, a week later, he mailed it to me. And I read it, and it was the first I've ever read of anything of its kind. And, uh, and of course, I told everybody in our, our congregation about it, and then we actually, in time, after everybody had a chance to uh, to get the book, we went through the book together. The congregation actually bought, man, I, I, we probably bought 50 copies or so, and we went oh, through wow. it as a class. Um, that's been several years ago now. So everybody at Skyline is familiar with Mike Shank. I mean, they, they know <laughs> the work. We refer and we great? reference Randall all the time. Fantastic. He's him and Jesus Christ. Those are the two stars of the story. Well, I think you, you say that, and I think you're being humble in some ways. But we, we refer to you in some, in, in in a lot of times. Of course, it's a real story. It's, it's ugly at times. It's honest. You know, your your thoughts are are you know. The, you know, like an, you know, you you think like a normal person does, even if it's not uh, <laughs> Christian like at times, especially when you were before you were you know, obeyed the gospel. So I appreciate that about you. I think uh, you know we we talk about Randall and how such an example he was, but to a to your credit, you stayed the course. You know, you loved uh, the word enough to find the truth, and I think that I don't know that you give yourself enough credit for that. I know there were times you were you were mad. You were frustrated with what you were reading or what Randall was saying or what others in the office were telling you, but you stayed the course and you, you come through it and your soul saved because of it. Well, you, you are super encouraging and, and you don't know how much that means to me. And I, I I was born and raised in a part of the world there in southern Illinois where this fighting was just a, a part of life. You know, if you if somebody said something to you that you didn't like <laughs> right. uh, you didn't you didn't reason with them with words, you <laughs> you uh you 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 jumped on him physically. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's funny because you know there you can you can read in the story of course you've read that you know the gospel this idea uh, really angered me. Uh, really upset me. Um that I was wrong spiritually that I was wrong. And you got to you got to think John folks have been raised by Good, moral, honest, loving, affectionate, sincere, hardworking people who pass on their beliefs, things that they hold very dear to their heart. Right. They pass that on to their children. Yes. And and their children love their parents and they love their family and they love what they've been taught. And so when you introduce expose scripture to people that they've never seen it is a shock it's a it's a it's traumatic and i think sometimes we don't realize how how traumatic that can be and and then the different responses that folks have some folks run off and they don't want to talk to you again some folks get mad and want to argue with you you know that's all I'll tell you what i think sometimes christians we fear if we try to share the gospel we fear what's going to happen yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Fear of, of, of the rejection, or that we're not, you know, we don't, we don't know enough, or, or whatever. Yes, all those, all those things, John. All those things. We've got to remember that when folks get angry, 
That is such a good thing. Do you remember Saul of Tarsus? Yeah. You remember how angry he was? Right. Well, look what look what he became. So we need to embrace it when folks get angry and just love on them, just like Randall did. Just love on them, be patient right. with them, and, and just keep on. That's a good point. <laughs> you know, I, 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 right? I tell our... Um, I tell it sometimes our, our teenagers in class, you know, you've got, you know, basically, you know, two reactions to this story, and you can see them both with the, with the martyr of uh, of Stephen and then on the day of Pentecost, both were pricked in their hearts, you know, and, and once they were, and it was to, totally different reactions, you know, it, it, uh, they rushed, you know, Stephen, but in Act 2, you know, they asked, what shall we do? Mm. But the the gospel yeah. messages were the same. Both of them give them the same message, but the crowd was different. They were both angry, probably, and hurt, but the reaction was totally different in those two uh, circumstances. Man, that's a that's a great point. Great. Well, well you know, the word is quick. It's powerful, sharper than any two edged sword. Right. That's what he said. So Piercing listen. even to the dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Man, you turn somebody inside out when you start showing them the Word of God. So you got to expect that when you're turning somebody inside out, got to expect there might be a powerful reaction. Right. Yeah, that's, that's One way or the other, and I, I think that you you kind of preface that in your book as you uh, as you the the reader opens the book. I think that's a warning to them. That in some way, shape, or form, this book is probably going to rattle your cage a little. Am I? Isn't that right? <laughs> That's exactly right. I put try to put a couple warnings in there. Exactly. Well, I think it's in Luke, right? I, I believe it's in Luke where Christ said that He didn't come to bring peace, but He came to bring a sword. You know. Uh, That's so. a good reference. That's what it's about. I, I know. You, what, I can't remember what. I'm ashamed to admit to you. I can't remember what chapter that is. It's in Matthew. I know that because he was talking about uh, separating you know, a father against son and mother, yeah, mother. Uh, and mm-hmm. brother against mm-hmm. anyway. So, yeah, how one's family will, may reject him for his sake. That's isn't that isn't that what he's speaking to right there and speaking about? Yeah, absolutely. If they if they took up their cross and followed him, there would be a price to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, I know you had no idea. You've already said that it would ever be as successful as selling over a million copies. But surely life is a little different than it was pre-2011. Am I right? <laughs> what's different? Tell yes. me what's, that, what's an author yes, brother. that has been successful as you have with this uh, and this powerful work that you're passionate about that is a, 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 a cause worth, a very, a very noble cause. Well, how's life? Change for you since uh, Muscle and Shell? That's an excellent question. I'll tell you, I think uh, probably the hardest thing to deal with has been the uh, notoriety. I guess you'd call it fame. And, and I know why folks isolate themselves now really? when they get some notoriety. Um, a few years ago, you know, we had the, we, we live in Colorado now, but, but we had a little farmhouse out in southern Illinois for a long time. And folks could find us real easy. We were out in the country, but, but people could look us up. And one night, about 11:30 at night, I hear a banging on my front door. Now, in the woods of Southern Illinois, when you hear a banging on your door at night, that late at night, it's a good idea to answer the door with a gun. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And I keep a shotgun pretty close, and so I don't want to paint a picture that folks don't want to see. I'm just going to tell you. I'm just going to be candid with you, John. I, I went to that door in my underwear. Go ahead. Okay? Because I'm thinking, hey, somebody's this far out here. I don't know what's going on, but uh, I had my shotgun in one hand, and I swung the front door open. And there were these two um, people. I would say they were in their late 50s at that time. and They both smiled real big. They were dressed nice. This is 1130 at night. Right. And they said, are are you Mike Shank? <laughs> and here I am. Here I am standing there. In my underwear. Nothing on but boxers <laughs> and a shotgun in my hand. And I said, yes, I am. And who are you and what do you want? And I was not in a very good mood. And certainly I didn't act as loving as I could act. And I'm right. saying to that now. But I said, yes, I am. Who are you and what do you want? And um, they said, well, we, we've driven 
all day and all night from North Carolina. We just wanted to meet you. Wow. And so that started happening a lot. Well, they, they didn't um, think that daytime hours would be a good time. Well, that's kind of what I thought, John. <laughs> you know, you folks were raised better than this. Come on. Uh, Did that become Go something ahead. that would happen from time to time? Yeah, that happened a lot. Uh, that happened wow. a lot. Well, and, now, now and, I kind of feel bad. Me and John didn't, uh, didn't make the trip to come see you. They just drove it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, hey. I bet it's changed a little bit because you got two uh, two country boys from Mississippi calling to do an interview right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed. That's absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's been it's been. Uh, but I want to tell you, it's been super positive. It's been a great blessing in so many ways. Um, we've we've met uh, uh, an astonishing volume of people that have reached out to us with with love and encouragement. Uh, that's just been mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. Uh, so hey, ninety nine percent of all of it has been fantastic. When you say notoriety. Do you mean like in the brotherhood or do you mean like when you go to visit? Do you mean people emailing, phone calls? What do you mean? I mean, I know who Mike Shank is, and I think anybody that read the book would know who, but how? Give me some specifics on you talk about that, that notoriety that, that's one of um, my experience. In, in the brotherhood, absolutely. Not really out, you know, a lot of folks that are not in the Lord's body, they, they don't they don't know right. the work, and and because you know they don't, it, it's a kind of a niche book, I guess. Yeah. Um, but the the volume of correspondence is uh, pretty remarkable. It's tough. It's real tough to keep up with. I, I have to apologize, to folks, all the time because um, the the letters and the cards and the emails that we get is just overwhelming. It's just me and Johnita. You know, we try to do everything ourselves. And and I think sometimes folks think we have a big staff and we have some kind of big office and we don't. We just right. we're just uh, we just work out of the garage and it's just me and her and the kids. So yeah, but the but the notoriety in when we travel, we can go places and normally we can worship and and folks will embrace us and love on us and they'll say, oh man, you're it's it's really funny, John. I'll I'll go someplace and introduce myself, hi, I'm Mike Shank, and they'll look me up and down, and they'll say, uh, you know, you're not the guy who wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I always have to, you know, yeah. I know I don't look like much. I really don't look like much, but, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Mike, I, I've, I've told some some uh, people, you know, here that, in, in Skyline, that in, in my opinion, Russell and the Shovel has been, to my generation, what the Jewel Miller film strips were to my parents. Man, that's one of the greatest compliments I've ever received. I mean that. I mean, uh, I hear them talk about them old film strips, you know, where they would show those all the time. And, and most of the shovel is, is probably superseded that in a lot of ways, at least in, in, for my generation. You know, within the church, most of the shovel is, is synonymous yeah. uh, with, with evangelism. And, you know, as, as Jewel Miller, you know, was in the 70s and 80s. Man, I, I'll tell you what, I, that's that's been said a couple times, and I I almost tear up. I I don't even know what to say to that. But thank you. I <laughs> I actually uh, on on that point, I preached a series. Uh, it's been several months ago, almost a year ago now, probably. But uh, I preached a series here at Skyline on evangelism, and I used that book uh, and, and probably three of the the lessons of that series for sure. So. Uh, definitely wow. being used. We actually did the um, a couple of years ago. We did the workbook too. I mean, we went through it in our our, our uh, young adult class. Uh, and it's just been a real effective tool uh, for us uh, here at Skyline. Like I said, I kind of in in our correspondence, I mentioned to you that uh, a few years ago, you know, we were bumping forty five, fifty fifty five on a on a Sunday morning, and and last Sunday, Mike, and we're just a country rural church in Mississippi. Uh, but we yeah. we got to one nineteen, and that's happened wow, over such a quick period of time. Yeah, and that's pretty that's pretty normal nowadays. We're excited about it, yeah. John Johnson, that's great, guys. That is great news. So Isn't that exciting? 
and we, I mean, it's got us, it is, it's got us pumped up for sure. We're, we're got, we've got, we're busting out our seams in our building, and we've got it, it creates new challenges, but they're exciting ones, you know. Oh man, I bet you can feel it in the air when y'all get together, can't you? I, I, Absolutely. I think uh, you know a lot of for us, uh, it's people are excited to come to church and they're excited to be here, and uh, and a lot of it is contribute to, you know, converting and. Uh, Obeying the gospel and being part of a, a congregation that's excited and enthusiastic and alive, you know. Man, oh man, that's that's fantastic. And how many how many visitors are are showing up? Are you getting a few visitors as there's, well? There's very few Sundays that go by when there isn't at least one or two visitors. And sometimes you'll have you know you know eight or ten. I yeah. mean, it just it just really depends. There's a there's a Church within uh, probably a what mile that's you know two fifty or so uh, that we kind of we're kind of in their shadow in some ways but uh, I don't know man we 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 have, we've had a good couple of years you know John now when you when you have those visitors come in do y'all uh, get those visitors and and try to engage in their life pretty quick do you take them out for dinner do you have them over to the house my God you try I to get them plugged in. in? You would be so proud of us. I think we are, I won't say the most, but one of the things we've had success is, with is, is we become friends first. And mm. we, we, we engage them outside of church. Uh, they don't come in knowing the truth, obviously, and they don't always seek the truth. Well, everybody likes a good friend. And everybody likes hey, to have amen, somebody brother. that they can uh, get to know. And, and that, I think that goes a long way. If you got you know people that are uh, enjoy being around one another, they enjoy fellowshipping and and uh, spending you know time outside of church together. I think that's been critical for us at Skyline. You know, brother, the, the the one thing that everybody wants, they want to be cared for, they want to be cared about, they want to be loved. Everybody wants that, and there's no better person to love than Jesus Christ. And you see, uh, you. Are Jesus to them? They've got to see Jesus Christ in you and through you. Right. You're yeah, the I'm conveyance kidding. of His love to others. And we ain't lost a, uh, a fellowship man. in a long time. <laughs> we we do a lot of a lot of time spent outside of church with all our all our. Yeah. Um, the, this uh, this congregation is different in a lot of ways because we've got so many people who just uh, well honestly we're just we're each other's. Best friends, you know, we we love hanging out and getting together and fellowshipping and uh, studying God's word together too. So it, it it all works out very well for us. You know, Jonathan, that that is so great that you say that because you think about the the body in the in the first century in the New Testament, it's not a building model and it's not a corporate right. model. It's a model of a family. That's what That's it right. is. It's a family. It is. And uh, and it sounds like y'all are doing that. We've got a good balance. You know, I think. A couple of years ago, we had we uh, had to hire a new minister. Our longtime minister uh, resigned, and we had to find another. So we did some surveys, kind of just around you know the church, and to figure out what our what our needs were, and we were trying to figure out you know what kind of what kind of congregation you know we wanted to be moving forward. And when we did that, did those surveys, we found out that I think it was like sixty five percent of our congregation at that time, which was three or four years ago, was less than 40 years old. So we're a, a relatively young Wow, guy, that's a really is, young group, yeah. Right, which is pretty unique and, and different. You, know, you go into a lot of congregations and you worry about them, and it makes you, you just, or I know I do, my heart breaks so many times when you go into a small congregation and you can, you know, there's there are very few children, you just wonder where they're going to be in the next 10 years, you know. And you hate to see doors shut, but it's 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 inevitable if you can't, if you can't grow somehow or another. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you, it sounds like y'all are doing great things. And can I can I can I rewind us just a little bit? Would that be okay if I did that? Absolutely, go right ahead. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. I've just I had a kind of a catch in my mind about the Jewel Miller film strips. Yeah. Um. I I, I just I just wanted to revisit that just for a second. And tell you how much I've always loved Jewel Miller. I never got to meet him. Anything like that, but see, John Eden and I, we were baptized at the Jackson Street uh, Church of Christ there in Nashville. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a, a black congregation, wonderful right. people, and yeah. and 
And, you know, Randall, we lived out in a subdivision of Nashville called Bellevue, which was about 20 minutes out, out of town, of course. And Randall and I had had some discussions, and he said, Mike, I don't want you to do anything that would prevent you from uh, fellowship. And he said, it's always better, in my experience. He said, I found that you need to find a congregation that's close to where you live so there's no hindrances. And I thought, man, right. that's smart. And it's funny, but we lived in a little apartment complex called Knollwood, K-N-O-L-L-W-O-D, right on Highway 70. And there was a big congregation not a block from us called the Bellevue Church of Christ. And Marlon Connolly was the preacher there at that time. He was also the professor of speech at Lipscomb. Now, this is back in 88, 87, 88. So we start attending there, and the very first day we're there, there's a guy by the name of Larry Schatzer who we found out was he was called the Minister of Evangelism. You guys with me? Yeah, okay. Okay. Larry meets us, and here's what he says to me, John. He said, Mike, I know that you and John Eda are brand new Christians. You were just baptized. He said, how would you like to see a film series that takes you from Genesis to Revelation, shows you all the major parts of the Bible, even shows you where every denomination came from? And he said, it's all in color. I don't know why that was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and our eyes got big, and we said, man, are you kidding? How much does that cost us? And he said, well, it doesn't cost you a thing, man. He said, I'll show it to you for free. Right. And we said, sign us up. And so every Tuesday night, we went down to the building. For five weeks, he showed us the Jewel Miller film strips. Greatest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Right. But, you know, and as, as great as those those scripts are, and they, I've seen pieces of them, and, and I think they actually have them on DVD now, but uh, to your credit, Mike, I mean, a lot of, 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 of new converts are, you know, they're, they're slow to engage, and uh, I, I think it kind of still points back to you in some ways that the decisions you made, you you, you made uh, the decision, you and John Ada, to, to engage and to, to grow immediately. You know, when you were probably at a time when it's pretty vulnerable, being a, a young Christian, you fed yourself, and that's that's on you. Man, I I appreciate that. I just think I'm I'm a really brother. I'm just an everyday, super average guy. I'm nobody special at all. And I'm thankful to God for His providence that He put people in our life like like Randall and like Larry Schatzer. Uh, and, right. and Larry shows us these film strips, and and John. At the end of film strip five, I jumped up and said, Larry, I've got a great idea. And he said, what's that? Now, I'm 20 years old. Okay, I'm 20 right. years old, and I was just baptized. So I'm going to be 21, a month, I think, a month from that time. And he said, what's your idea, Mike? I said, how about we take these film strips and these workbooks, and we go out and we show this to the lost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a great idea. <laughs> and Larry Larry looked at me like like I was some kind of genius. I mean, this is what a good people person he was. He says, Mike, that's a great idea. <laughs> you know, and, right. and, yeah. and I didn't realize, you know, that, that that's what that that's what Christians did at that time. That's how they evangelized. And so uh I said, Larry, let me and Johnny to buy one of these big projectors and a screen and he said, no way, we'll give it to you if you'll go out and show it. And so we started showing the, the Jewel Miller film strips. That's right. kind of how we got our start in evangelism. I'm going there so that's part one of our interview with Michael Shank, author of Muscle and a Shovel series. Mike is such a genuine guy who really shies away from the notoriety and gives all the glory to the Lord. He has a true love for the Lord's church. And he has a special interest in evangelizing to lost souls. You can tell he, he really gets excited about the possibility of sharing the gospel, edifying, and, and growing the church. It was evident to me that he was careful not to sound boastful, but rather pointed to God's providence in his work. And it's certainly easy to see God's hand and the power of the gospel in his story. We'll switch gears and finish our interview with Mike in the next episode.
part two. So give it a listen to fully understand the man behind Muscle and the Shovel. Until next time, y'all be good.